I'd like to thank my patrons for their generous support. It helps to make my research, writing, and videos available to everyone. If you enjoy my videos, please like them, share them, and subscribe to my channel. And if you want to support my work, then please visit my Patreon page and look into becoming a patron. The link is below this video. I thought, yeah, great, I'll do a talk about water horses. I know quite a bit about them. And then I started sort of looking for the actual folklore, and it seemed to be like the same, the same facts and ideas just got repeated, especially in the Scottish stuff. And what I could find about Nugles, which are the Shetland water horses, it was similar. I couldn't find that many collected stories, you know, more allusions to stories, but always the same handful of stuff. So having said that, I collected a story about the Keffeldur yesterday. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you know who Tiflin Penry is. She's a Welsh lady. She's a, she's a witch, uh, older lady. And she knew I was working on this and she sent me this little story. So she, I think she lives in the Rhonda somewhere. And she said she was uh, driving uh, at night just a few years ago when she saw a white horse standing in the road. Well, straight horses in the Welsh countryside aren't all that unusual. But she said as she got a little closer, she could see that it wasn't real. It was like made out of mist or water vapor or something. And she was so sure that it wasn't solid that she just kept driving. And she said it was everything was fine and there was this she had passenger. She said there was a stunned silence in her car. And then somebody finally said, did, did we just drive through a horse? So she, it wasn't just her that saw it, you know? So I just thought that was really interesting how, <clears throat> I mean, I identify Kathleen as a witch, but she's a very sensible woman, you know, a very down to earth person and uh, well-educated and all that, you know? And she was just like, I said, what do you think was going on there? And she just said, I think it just wanted to show itself. Just, hello, I'm here, you know? When I lived in Edinburgh, I had a lot of friends from Shetland and I got quite interested in Shetland music and Shetland uh, folklore and stuff. In fact, I got, got the friends through an interest in fiddle music. So in Shetland, they have a water horse called a nuggle or a nuggle. And it's, it's a little bit unusual. Of course, it's more pony sized, more Shetland pony sized, but some of the ponies in Shetland used to be big enough that they, they could be ridden, although you wouldn't want to ride them very far, you know, but they're so strong. So guys did ride them sometimes, adults did ride them. So I got interested in nugles. Now nugles have a couple of things that are different than other water horses you might know. So they have a tail, so it's said, that's like a wheel. And this tail, some people say it even propels the horse through the water when it's in the water because this would allow them to be recognized as nugles. They had a way of sort of tucking it under between their legs so it wasn't immediately obvious that they had this weird tail. And there's also a tradition that they used to stop mills, so water mills. So they would be in the stream where the mill was working and they would get hold of the something on the wheel and stop the mill. And it was a real annoyance for the millers. And they, they would, um, the, the nugle doesn't like fire. So they would, they would take a flaming torch or a peat or something out of the fire and throw it down through the, the hatch thing. And then the, the mill would go again, the nugle would be gone. And there's even a, there's a mill in Shetland, which is a, abandoned and which is said to be they just gave up because the nugles just bothered them too much there and they just abandoned the whole thing. So like a lot of these water horses, the nugles would entice people to ride them into and and then uh, they'd take them into the water. But unlike the Echushka of Scotland, they uh, it was more mischievous. They would just give people a good ducking usually. They didn't kill them or eat them or anything. Um, and then when the, the horse would swim away, there would be like blue flames or mist or something. 
so that was that was what was going on with the nugles and so there's a the word nugle it's spelled n j u w g l e nugle seems to be part of a germanic etymological package of nuken and nuk and nix and in fact also relates to things like saint nicholas and calling the devil old nick it's all one weird <clears throat> package and the scandinavians and north germans have water horse stories too not unlike the ones we have in britain uh, I don't know much about the Irish ones, so I'm not going to go there tonight. Either it's a Germanic thing that was brought with the Saxons or the Vikings or somebody, or it's something which has just been, you know, all over Northern Europe at one time and just taken a slightly different form in different cultures. There's, I don't think there's any way to really know the answer to that. So there was a story in Shetland from a place called Nesting. Uh, a young man called James Gregg had some tame horses that he had out to grass. And sometimes he might catch one of them on the way home from somewhere, especially if night was coming on, and he'd ride it home. But he knew there was a danger in this because he thought he might be fooled and, and, and catch a nugle instead, you know, and he didn't want to do that. Um, so he had, a, there was a belief in Shetland that if you put a steel bridle on a nugle, you could overpower it. So he always carried like a steel bit and a bridle in his pocket in case he decided he wanted to, to catch a horse and ride it home. And uh, yeah, one time it happened. So he wasn't paying attention. He didn't look for that wheel and he, he got on this horse and he had, fortunately he put the bridle on it because it went straight for the water, you know? He took the, the rein on the landward side, you know, and started like pulling really hard, really hard. And he managed to like, there was a bit of a tussle, but he managed to overpower this thing and uh, get off it. And as he was taking the bridle off, he looked and uh, there was no horse. There was just this, like this mass of like jelly-like stuff, like a, like a jellyfish or something. So in Scotland, we have the Ech Ushka, which literally just means water horse. Uh, obviously by the name it would be, but it seems to be pretty much a, a thing of the Gaelic speaking regions. People ask me about Kelpies and honestly, I'm as confused as anybody about this. You hear all these distinctions, like one belongs to the river and the other belongs to locks or one's fresh water and the other one is salt water but I don't see any consistency at all in these claims. I don't think we have enough recorded folklore about water horses, like from a really early date to get away from like borrowings and influences between culture and stuff. And the folklorists who did record these things also didn't always stick to the words that local people used. Like they called selkies mermaids for goodness sake. So I don't think that that it's safe to make like a distinction between Kelpies and water horses in one as one having some properties and the other having other properties. It just doesn't seem to me that it works at all. So Ehushke is pretty much always bad news. Like the, the new goal might just be out for a bit of a laugh at, at your expense, but the, um, Behakushka is going to do you some harm if it can, or at least in most stories, that's the way it goes. And there seem to be like three kinds of basic lore about water horses or about Ehushka. If I say water horse now, I'm just talking about the Ehushka. So it entices people onto its back. And sometimes it'll even have like a beautiful saddle and bridle with gold and silver on it and stuff. And it's very often, not always, but it's very often a black horse with a flowing mane and tail. And, you know, there are stories about both men and women lured onto its back. And once you're on, you stick, you can't get off. You can't throw yourself off anymore. So then it runs into the water with you where it eats you. And very often people will see either the liver or the lungs of the person that's been eaten float to shore later. 
And I think the idea of something like that's a bit amorphous like that seems very closely linked to water horses. Remember the, the nugle and the jelly after the guy took the, you know, was taking the bridle off. And also sometimes when various water horses are said to kill their own kind, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, sometimes uh, organs will float to shore or some kind of a mass will be seen in the water. Uh, but, you know, I think you often see like odd froths or scum on bodies of water um, spawn even, and maybe that's where some of those ideas come from. Maybe that's a way of explaining their presence. I don't know. So sometimes it was children who were lured to ride these water horses. And usually it would end up that there'd be a whole bunch of children in these stories that would get on the horse's back. And of course, because you stick, when one child would reach down to pull another one up, that child would be st stuck to the hand of the one that was pulling him up. That's, that's how it went. And so as more children would get onto the horse, it would magically get longer to accommodate them all on its back. And there's, there's quite a few stories about how there's, there's one little guy that, that can't, uh, can't make it up. He either grabs the tail or he grabs his brother's hand or, you know, something like that, but he can't, he can't get up. He's too wee. And uh, he ends up having to take his knife and cut his own fingers off in order to save himself. And the brothers, you know, tells him to do it or, you know, various variations on that. So there were some things to look for to know whether it was a normal horse or an Echushka. So I've mentioned the wheel in Shetland, but that's the only way, place I've ever heard of that. But often the hooves would be on backwards. So then, or the nose would be pointed. Sometimes the nose was said to be like a beak or it would be like a kind of a, a kind of a more of a rubbery sort of snout or something like that. I, I think there's, there's something going on with, with horses with beaks and you know how the uh, Uffington horse looks. You know, it has that beak-like thing at the front. And then I've, I've often thought, well, maybe that's like something to do with this, either a fear of aggressive horses biting or, or skull horses like the Mariluid and ritual uses of horse skulls that, you know, that that all somehow works in together. I don't know. These horses could also take human form and you might see that the man had hooves or you might see that he had sand or pondweed or something in his hair. <clears throat> and there are one or two where they turn into women and those seem to be in groups, but most of the time uh, they turn into men and they, they, they're very handsome and they lure young girls and often it's, um, Girls who've been sent to the sheiling, which are like huts that people used to go to in the highlands in the summer, where they would take the cattle up to graze on the summer grass. And very often they would send girls up with the cows because the cows still had to be milked every day and cheese made or something. So they would send the girls up with the cattle to look after them. And then there would be, and of course they'd need to be relatively near water so that the cattle could drink. So the shielings were often quite, you know, near a loch side or a riverside or something. And then they would be plagued by these uh, water horses, either in horse form or in the form of man, men. Anyway, these men, they would wait until they had hold of the woman somehow, or she was touching them and then she would be stuck to them. And then they'd take horse form and drown her and eat her. And then there's a third kind of story where, and these are quite common in Germany and Scandinavia too, I think, where the, the farmer has some kind of a charm, uh, a cow shackle around its neck or something, you know, some thing to do. Uh, I think in Wales, there was something with a hawthorn flower in your pocket or something that you could then have power over the horse and they would use them as cart horses or use them to do the plowing, but they would be so tame that almost inevitably in the story, you know, the farmer would one day he would forget to do whatever this thing was to keep control of it. And it would take his plow or his cart and sometimes him into the water and drown him. But quite often in those stories, he's plowing and it just takes the plow and there'll be a, 
a big furrow and often there may be a some kind of a landmark that this explains a landmark you know of some kind of a furrow like landmark going into a law I don't think anybody mostly dies in those stories those farmer stories so i've got a story for you about an ehushki it's not i haven't told this before i just found it recently now it was published in 1822 um, in a book called Popular Superstitions and Festive Amusements of the Highlanders of Scotland <laughs> by William Grant Stewart. <laughs> but even, even though the book's 200 years old, yeah, I have my doubts as to whether this is an entirely traditional story, but I like the story, so I'm going to tell it to you. I think it could, it could be a bit of a Victorian fancy. I don't know. <clears throat> I thought that about another story, which has some similar properties a while back. Um, a story about a Selkie and uh, Tom Muir put me straight and said, no, that's a traditional story. So yeah, maybe it is traditional. So anyway, there was a man called James McGregor. He was living near Loch Ness and the whole area was being terrorized by this water horse and it had killed and eaten a few people. And McGregor was sort of a big strong guy and thought he was kind of an important man in the district, you know, and he thought if he met the horse, he'd be able to get the better of it. Well, he got his wish one day, he was walking between Strasbay and Inverness when he meets the Echushka and it's trying to get him to get on its back, you know, but he's too smart for that. So he, got, he went up to it like as if he trusted it. He didn't get on and then he drew his sword and he smacked it really hard over the nose. Horse lover pain. <laughs> when he did that, its bridle broke and the bit fell on the ground. And McGregor thought the horse would attack him at that stage, but it just stood there. And he was curious about the bit. So he picked it up and put it in his pocket. And then to his surprise, the horse began to speak to him. And it's like, told him in no uncertain terms just what an awful man he was and he was terribly rude and he was unkind to horses bothering the poor animal and it was just minding its own business and blah 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 <laughs> really just gave him an earful right so James McGregor gives it as good as he got and he's like listing the crimes of the water horse you know the deceit the killings you know all of this <clears throat> and the horse is like no no I had to do it that was the only way that I could live, you know, that's just my nature. Uh, it's just the way of things. I was only trying to make an honest living, you know, and he begged to have the bridle back. Please give me my bridle back. And McGregor saw that the bit and the bridle were really important to this horse, you know, so he wondered why. So he said that he might give it back if he knew why it was so important. So the Echushka told him that if he looked through the rings on the bit, he could see into the world of the Fae. He could see him singing and dancing and all of this. And McGregor thought this was probably a trick, so he didn't look. But he also didn't give the bit back. So now the horse looked like it really might attack him. And, you know, that might have some power in the bit. It wanted it back so bad. And the horse was kind of tentative, you know, he was like, well, I won't I and McGregor only had to like get his sword up, and kind of brandish it a bit and the horse would back away. So it was kind of a standoff. So McGregor then decided that it was safe, he would just go home. So he started walking home with the bit in his pocket, but the horse was following him, you know, give me the bit, give me the bit. Finally, he got to his house. The horse saw what he was going to go in ran to, in front of the door and blocked his way and McGregor was a bit wary to go through the door so he went round to the back window and he called his wife and he handed her the bit in through the window and the horse knew what had happened and the horse looked up and it saw that the McGregor's had a, a, a cross of Rowan over the door so again you know that's against all kinds of evil witches and stuff so that it knew it couldn't ever go in the house and get the bit so it just it just went away and nobody ever saw it again um, and they say that the bit is still in that family's possession or at least that's what they said in 1822 so that's kind of a kind of a good story I don't know
So the Kefal Dürer, um, there was a story I really wanted to tell you. I couldn't find it. I will tell you in a minute what I remember of it, but it's a little bit sketchy. So the Kefal Dürer, Kefal Dürer just means water horse again, it's Welsh. And they're a bit different again uh, because they can fly. So they lured people onto their backs, as you would expect, but then they would fly up into the air and shake the person off so they'd be killed by the fall. And I don't know if, I think sometimes they may have dropped them into water and drowned them that way, and maybe they did eat them, but that the eating, the devouring doesn't seem, in the stories that I've found anyway, it doesn't seem to be such a big feature. And there was this weird belief in Wales that the clergy could ride water horses with complete safety. And, and I know there's a story, is, there's not much to it, but the, the story uh, that there was a minister riding on a Kefal Dürer, uh, going wherever he was going, um, and he had his clerk with him. And he felt sorry for his clerk that he had to walk and couldn't ride as well, but he wasn't a minister, he was just a clerk, you know. Um, so he said, well, get up on the back with me, but just be really, really quiet, you know, just be really quiet. And of course the Kefeldur took off and it began to fly and it was going really fast. And the, the clerk said, oh my God, or something. You know? <laughs> and immediately the, the, the water horse just like shook him off and dumped him and that was, that was him dead, you know. And apparently, according to the story, the minister just said, oh, served him bloody right. <laughs> So the story that I that I, I don't fully know, uh, what I remember of it is there was a guy trying to walk home at night and it was very dark. I think the weather was bad. And after a while he saw sort of a glow in front of him. And it was the only, only thing he could see. And first he thought it was the light of a house maybe, or you know, he started to follow it, but he felt like he was following some kind of a light but it seemed to be showing him the road. So that was a good thing. And anyway, he made it home in one piece. And I think maybe as he came home, he saw like a horse or a donkey or something uh, go into the river near the house where he was going. He made it home anyway. And they, apparently these people told him, well, yeah, that, that can happen. That sometimes Kefal Dürer will sort of lead people home. So it's interesting how there's so many, so many different perceptions of Kefaldur. You know, it's it's dangerous, or it's a joker, or it's actually helpful. And I, I kind of wonder, having been around horses a lot and observed people around horses, including people that don't nor normally. Uh, spend time around horses, but even some of those who do. And I just wonder if it says something about how people feel about horses. You know, people used to be, until recently, very dependent on horses. They didn't always have a lot of choice about having contact with them. But a lot of people were also, and still are, killed by horses, badly injured by horses. And that must have been exponentially greater at a time when they were just everywhere and more people had dealings with them. And I remember my own father. Now my father was born in 1905. Uh, he was quite old by the time I was born. So um, he used to tell me how his, his own father had a, a canvas making business and he had draft horses to make deliveries. And my father wasn't very big, but he was the only boy in the family. And so he had to take care of these draft horses was absolutely terrified of them. My father wasn't, was never good around horses. Um, and I, well, I'm sure he wasn't very big because he wasn't a very tall guy even when he was an adult. So he was just frightened of these horses. I don't know if they were gentle or not, or if it was just his own fear, you know, but he had dreams, recurring dreams his whole life about being chased by a pair of draft horses. So I think there is a lot of a lot of stuff in people's psyche. And you know, it's, if you do work with horses, like Sarah will know what I'm talking about. 
you get somebody that wants to come and see your horses or they want to come see a stable or something and uh, they don't actually realize how big a horse is it it it's a lot bigger in real life than it seemed with the cowboy standing beside it on television. <laughs> you know, when you see a person and a horse, you can see how big the horse is in a picture, but you don't have that sense of its immense weight and presence. And a lot of people are quite, find out that they're quite frightened of, of horses then when they actually are confronted with one.